uh, hi to all our audience today. Um, uh, today's topic is about personal finance. Uh, that's the reason of the title. So uh, let me start with uh, the presentation, the one that we have uh, for today. Um, so um, I want to bring this topic into these webinars because I believe that uh, when we're talking about our incomes and also savings, well, it is relevant in this moment, uh, particularly uh, because um, as we already know, we have these uh, viral situation uh, worldwide, and it has uh, had a lot of uh, bad implications uh, on the economy, and more precisely in the household income. Um, so um, this is the relevance of this topic, to talk about um, household income, and how can you manage this income? And moreover, uh, if there is a way to build savings, uh, how can we do it? So uh, this is the um, to today's topic. Uh, just before uh, talking about uh, income and savings, I would like to, to talk briefly about some beliefs that people have uh, about uh, monetary income. Um, one of them is that uh, to earn uh, this monetary income, you have to work hard. And I believe this is widespread, uh, widespread belief, not just, uh, let's say, here in our country, Colombia, but also, I believe, uh, in the majority of the countries all around the world. What you see there in the... Um, in the, in the slide basically is a, a rough characterization of economically active uh, people all around the world. Uh, we can classify uh, these persons uh, among uh, four main uh, classifications. Uh, most of us, I believe, uh, are in the first quadrant here as an employee but we can also uh, think about people that are self-employed, uh, also entrepreneurs and investors. Uh, as I told you before, I believe most of us are employees. Uh, probably uh, the least of the population are investors uh, if you move into those quadrants. So depending on how we are there in, in this uh, characterization, probably we won't be working as hard as we think but probably we will be working more uh, the, in a more intelligent way. So let's talk about, let's say, the first kind or the, or the first classification, uh, which is employees. And I want to focus here for a while because I would like to uh, uh, emphasize on the characteristics of this sort of uh, population when we're talking about uh, monetary income and generating monetary income. Uh, firstly, I would like to address that uh, when we're talking about employees, uh, uh, we need to bear in mind that uh, the, the monetary income is represented mainly or mostly by uh, salaries. And this salary is normally fixed. It's a, an amount of money that is fixed and probably it changes like every year. Uh, but normally you will be perceiving a fixed amount of money every month or every 15 days. Uh, moreover, uh, when we're talking about generating this income, uh, even though you're working, uh, you're just uh, uh, perceiving this fixed amount of money, uh, but you will be perceiving this amount of money because your employer, the company that you be you have been working on um, is doing well, meaning they're having sales, for example, uh, sales income, for example. As long as the company is okay, you will be perceiving uh, your income. Otherwise, uh, like in these moments, probably the, the company will be closing just because it's not selling, therefore you won't perceiving uh, your income. Uh, the, the main conclusion here is that uh, as long as you're working hard, 
uh, your income will not be depending on your effort. Basically, it will be depending on how the uh, company is doing, uh, basically. And the last characteristic of being an employee, uh, an employee is that, well, you have to fulfill these uh, daily schedules for working, uh, meaning that you will be, let's say, uh, entering uh, at 8 or 9 a.m. to work and leaving uh, the office at 5 o'clock. Well, I mean in normal, in, in normal times. Um, therefore, your uh, time, your personal time is limited to those hours that you're not spending uh, at work. So these are the main characteristics of an employee. When we go to the next classification, which would be the self-employed, uh, the difference with the employees is that a self-employed person is uh, basically having its... Uh, uh, it's, it's working for themselves. They have their own job. Uh, that would be the difference. Uh, the thing here is that a self-employed person uh, won't receive any monetary income as long as uh, she is not working, meaning that uh, still you have to work hard to get your monetary income. If there is, uh, let's say, for example, one day that you are not going to work by yourself, it means that you're not generating income for that day and therefore you will be having, well, monetary problems. Uh, when we look at the other side of the spectrum, uh, when you look at uh, the entrepreneurs, uh, things are changing here. Firstly, when, uh, we're, when we're talking about uh, entrepreneurship, uh, these uh, people, are searching for financial independence. Uh, what does it mean? Basically, uh, that they're working with their own system, namely uh, their own business. Uh, if that's the case, uh, they will be uh, putting effort into their own business to generate monetary income. Uh, it means that as long as they're working in their um, own work system, they will have flexible time. So we have here two main differences between uh, the employees and the self-employed people uh, with uh, entrepreneurs. Firstly, uh, entrepreneurs are working their own business, in their own business, sorry. And second, uh, time is not limited anymore. So they have, um, let's say, more free time at their disposal. And this is really important because obviously, besides generating monetary income, you would like to have more time for yourself or for your family. The thing is with the entrepreneurs is that a monetary income uh, does not entirely depend on their own effort and on their own business in the sense that uh, as long as their businesses are not doing well, well, their monetary income will be harmed. Um, finally, we have investors. Yeah, and investors may be the type of people that uh, are not working that hard, meaning they're not putting a lot of effort, physical effort for saying something like, uh, for giving an example, uh, into their work, they're trying to make it like more intelligent. Uh, this is when we see uh, the shark type of um, investor or the angel investors. Uh, they are searching for others' ideas so they can invest in these ideas. Uh, in this case, uh, what they're doing is uh, leverage, uh, giving leverage to others' businesses. In return, they will be getting some dividends on the investment. Uh, as you can see here, because investors are not um, um, are not putting all their time into this uh, activity, well, they ha will have uh, more flexible time than the other ones. So the first thing that I would like you to get out from this slide is that uh, 
okay, it's not all about working hard, but you can also work more in, in, a, in a more intelligent way in the sense that you can put your money to work for you and it would be uh, on the investor side. The other thing that I would like you to take away from this slide is that uh, the, uh, the, the, the salary is not the only source of income. So as in finance, uh, you can also diversify your sources of income uh, if you want to, to, to see this uh, slide, not just with your salary, but if you have some self-employment or if you have your own businesses, well, uh, these are ways to uh, diversify your income. So this is the objective of this first slide. The second belief, uh, well, uh, when we're talking about personal finance is that debt is harmful. So uh, a lot of people don't want to be in debt because they think that, well, I, I, I wouldn't like to put it in this way, but sometimes people believe that uh, debt is evil. So uh, the idea here is that not all of debt is harmful. Uh, we have the following uh, on this slide. Firstly, uh, in any economy, you will find households, families, you will, fi you will find companies, and also you will find the government. This is a rough abstraction of the reality. Uh, depending on your economic activities, uh, any of these economic agents will be uh, generating monetary income, but they will also have some expense. Uh, for example, uh, as a household, uh, Let's go back to the employee. You will have your income uh, based on your salary, uh, but you also will have to cover some expenses like utilities, uh, groceries, and so on. With companies, uh, companies will generate income um, by uh, selling their main products, but they also have to incur some costs in order to produce or to sell their products. And the government, we already know that, uh, well, the income depends, uh, makes uh, th their income depends mainly on tax revenues, and they have a lot of money to spend, like in infrastructure, um, uh, wages for the public sector, and so on. So, in this economic, depending on of the economic. Uh, dynamic of the households or the companies on the governments, you will be generating either a, a surplus or a deficit when you compare your income uh, with your expenses. Uh, and because we have, on the one hand, surpluses, and on the other hand, we have deficits, well, we can talk about savings, financing, and investing because uh, the surplus will be directed to those needs, to those economic agents that are needing uh, to uh, cover their deficits in order to continue their economic activities. In the case of households, the, the, the surplus will be known as disposable income. Uh, in companies, basically you will, you will generate cash if you look at your cash flow and the governing will be the fiscal surplus or deficit. Uh, continuing with this um, line, uh, as I told you before, uh, when we're talking about surpluses, basically either uh, the government or um, companies or households uh, are uh, having all these monetary resources that they need to save. And on the other hand, also there will be some households or, um, or even though the government, right, or some companies that they have deficits. So with the surplus on the one hand and the deficit on the other hand, uh, well, uh, there are some financial vehicles that will meet both the needs of some agents and the surpluses of others. And this is when financing uh, appears and also investing. And when we're talking about uh, financing, this is when we're talking about uh, debt. 
even though financing can uh, happen either by debt or uh, let's say through the uh, capital markets with securities, okay? Uh, savings becomes the source of this financing. So when we're talking about savings, uh, if you just uh, think about yourselves, uh, probably you will be accustomed to uh, put your money on your bank on a banking account, right? So this is when you will be receiving some interest on the money that you're leaving in the bank. But uh, for some others, maybe savings uh, mean that they're investing in uh, at the stock exchange, for example, right? So what you are uh, make, uh, what you're getting from uh, putting your savings uh, in the capital markets will be the capital gains uh, of your savings, and moreover, you will be perceiving dividends. Um, let's continue, and let's go exactly to this part of debt. Uh, as I told you before, uh, there will be households that will be needing money because they have some deficit or basically because they want to finance a project, right? Uh, so when does a debt is not harmful or when does debt is good? So first, you have to check uh, the interest rate at which you are getting uh, your credit. So I believe this would be a good opportunity. I mean, today, it's a good opportunity because as you may know, a lot of countries, I mean, central banks in different countries, countries have lowered down their um, interest rates. Uh, this is a, a measure to uh, give a push to the economy so we can consume and also the uh, the companies may invest more. So as long as the interest rates are too low, it means that once you get a credit, let's say during this time, uh, uh, the cost of getting this credit is too low. So during these difficult times, I believe this is a good opportunity uh, if you're searching for debt uh, because you need to finance uh, something uh, specific this would be a good opportunity um, to to get good debt in the sense that the interest rate that you will be receiving is too low. Uh, another characteristic when you're thinking about a good debt is that the interest rate should be not just low, but uh, mostly it should be fixed, meaning that uh, as long as you're paying your loan or your credit, uh, your interest rate is not going to change. And this is very um, important uh, because uh, sometimes uh, when you're paying a loan, uh, you get a, 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 an unexpected change on the installments that you have to pay. And uh, mostly, uh, sorry, and most of the times the reason is that uh, the interest rate is changing, it's resetting and it's being higher. Therefore, you will be paying more interest on the money that you're owing. Uh, so when you're searching for good debt, uh, you have also to uh, try to get a fixed rate on that. If not, uh, you can also search for an index rate. Uh, but the most important thing of this index rate is that uh, you need to bear in mind that it will work to you for you, sorry, as long as interest rates are getting lower. If interest rates are increasing, you should avoid these credits that have a um, uh, index rate. This uh, topic on interest rates uh, will help you out to have more certainty on your cash flow. So when we're talking about expenses, right? Uh, and if you have good debt, one of the uh, consequences of having good debt is uh, that you're gonna be able to have a stable and known cash flow. And this is really important because when you have bad debt, uh, normally what will happen 
uh, is that you won't be able to uh, know in advance how much money you will have to pay for the credit that you have asked uh, for at the beginning. One example of this is the use of credit cards, right? When you're using credit cards uh, on a, on a um, well, when you're using credit cards more often, right, and you are uh, not just using them, but leaving all your um, credit for the long term, and you still e use your credit card every month, the installment that you have to pay for the debt that you have collected there by using your credit card would change. And it is really difficult to uh, calculate the amount of money that you will have to pay as long as you will be using and using and using your credit card. So that would be uh, the other side of the spectrum when you're using bad debt uh, to finance what you're needing. So the main takeaway of this slide is a search for low interest rates, fixed in interest rates, and the result will be the and the result will be that uh, you will uh, know in advance with more certainty uh, your cash flow, how much money you will need to uh, pay the installments of your debt. Uh, another belief is that uh, when you're talking about personal finance is that most of the people believe that because they don't know anything about finance, well, they don't have to do with them. And uh, well, what I want, what I want you to know here is that uh, you don't need to know about finance. Um, to uh, check first uh, for uh, your income, then for your expenses and how to manage them. Um, when we're talking about finance here is when you then need to think about first uh, the financing options that you will have on the market. And then also if you have some surplus or if you have savings, how you can save this money in the market. Right, so this is when you probably will need some elements of finance, and these elements are, I believe, are uh, not that complicated. Uh, but for the rest, if you need to uh, make a budget, uh, taking into account uh, all your income and your expenses, well, in this case, you just don't need finance. So, most importantly. What you will be needing uh, in the case for managing your um, money uh, in this field of personal finance, uh, first uh, you will be uh, you you will need to be very um, uh, savvy of your uh, spending habits, right? Uh, well, you 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 will know, have to know very clear your sources of income, right? And moreover, uh, you will need to know what would you like to accomplish based on, um, I mean, those goals that will, will be fulfilled uh, through monetary income. Uh, and as you can see here, I believe you don't need that much of finance just to get organized uh, these things. So now that I have talked about the beliefs. Uh, let's go to the topic of uh, the, the, the other part of the talk here. The topic is about budgeting. Uh, later, we will be talking about uh, savings. So let's go with budgeting. So the first thing that you need to do when you want to uh, make a budget uh, uh, taking into account your personal finance uh, is uh, you have to run a financial diagnostics. Um, you have to check firstly uh, your sources of income, monetary income, and you have also to check how you spend the money that you uh, earn, right? Uh, for the first uh, side of this slide uh, about your income, uh, it would be a good idea to check your uh, monthly income. Uh, I believe when, let's say when 
when you are earning salary, you will be receiving on a monthly basis a um, a receipt with the money that you have earned and that you have received on your banking account. So uh, based on history, uh, you can have uh, a good idea of your income on the future, right? Uh, once you have identified all your sources of income, like your wage or salary, and also the variable part of your income, uh, let's say bonuses, uh, you have to sum them all, right? So you, you may know on a monthly basis uh, the total amount of your monetary income. And when we go to the uh, expenses side, uh, you have to classify them between your mandatory expenses and your discretionary expenses. Uh, so you have to make a list. Uh, the list, uh, you will have to be uh, very specific uh, on your mandatory expenses. Uh, as an example, I can give you uh, the rent if you're living uh, not in your own house, um, the utilities, how much money you are spending on utilities uh, on a monthly basis, groceries as well. Uh, if you have children, how much money you're spending on the education. Uh, also, something really important that you have to take into account uh, when you're talking about mandatory expenses, uh, it is the debt installments that you have to pay. Um, and I want to emphasize this point because, well, nowadays we are in this situation about the COVID. A lot of people are losing their, their jobs. Uh, uh, but the thing here is that uh, at least you have to avoid not uh, paying these installments. Uh, I, I think we're uh, uh, sorry, we're going to talk about this uh, in a while. Another mandatory expense that you have to check uh, would be uh, transportation. Uh, in a more, uh, more specifically, uh, the amount of money that you are spending on tickets, right? If you are taking public trans transportation, that's what I mean. Once you have identified all these mandatory expenses, you have to sum them all. So you will, will have a, a very close idea of what will be your uh, monthly expenses on such items. You have also to check for these discretionary expenses. Uh, one of them would be, let's say, entertainment. But I want to focus here on some expenses that uh, we incur on a daily basis. These expenses are low in amount, uh, but the thing is that uh, because they are low in amount, we do not take them into account when we're budgeting because we think that they are not that important. But when you sum them all at the end of the month, you realize that that's a lot of money. These type of um, expenses are known as ant expenses. And well, Basically, we have, uh, as an example, uh, parking. Uh, parking is an expense in the sense that when, when you're using your car, uh, probably you will have to, to pay for parking. You don't have that into your budget. Uh, um, if you do that on a daily basis, then uh, your parking uh, expense will be a huge part of your total expenses. So. This is one of these and expenses that you need to, to take care of. Uh, another one would be eating out. Well, I know we are confining our houses lately, so I believe we have lowered, not by, well, not because we want it, but because we have to. We lower these um, and expenses, eating out. Another an expense that you will have to take care of is the one that uh, is related to impulsive purchases. Sometimes we are online and we want to buy something that we believe we need, but later we realize that we are not even going to use it. So we have to take also care of these uh, sort of expenses. 
uh, and another unnecessary services. Um, sometimes, uh, well, I know we use uh, these streaming services a lot, video streaming services and also music streaming services a lot, but uh, if you realize sometimes they're not that necessary. So these are the type of ant expenses that you may uh, take care of. Uh, another one of them would be uh, cravings, for example, uh, when you feel that you would like to eat something or uh, drink something uh, because uh, you, you are liking that mood and you just go for it and buy a brownie, buy your coffee, and then you do it like uh, every day. Uh, then you realize that even though you, you just didn't have that uh, expense on your budget, uh, at the end of the month, you realize that you spend a lot of money in cravings. So this is another and expense that you need to take care of, okay? So once you have done your financial diagnostics, uh, well, uh, in difficult times like this, uh, you need to adjust your expenses. Uh, how can you do that? First, you need to check your debt installments, right? Uh, why is that? Because probably debit settlements will be uh, putting a lot of pressure uh, in your, oh, sorry, on your monthly cash flow. Probably debit settlements will be a huge part uh, of uh, expenses. Uh, therefore, a lot of the money that you are earning, it's going to pay this debit settlement. So, uh, you can adjust the amount of money that you are uh, paying for debt. Uh, well, for example, if you talk to your local bank and search for uh, refinancing, uh, or if you have the opportunity to talk to another bank that is willing to pay or to buy uh, your debt from the other bank. What you need to take into account here is uh, as before, as I told you before, uh, the interest rate that you will be paying on uh, this new deal that you will be getting out of your debt. Uh, the, the important fact here is that the interest rate that you will be getting, the new interest rate should be lower than the one that you got before. Otherwise, you won't be doing anything, right? Uh, I, I, I can tell you here in, in our country, for example, uh, uh, the uh, interest rates are real high. Uh, you get like, uh, sorry, you have to pay like 2% uh, on a monthly basis when you're using your credit card. Uh, but when you uh, search for another uh, banking institution that's willing to buy that debt to the other bank, uh, this other banking institution will be uh, charging you just 1% on a monthly basis, meaning that you will be cutting uh, that expense uh, 50%. So that's a good deal. Uh, so if you want to uh, lower your debit installments, well, you have a task there. You need to uh, um, call your bank or uh, you have to, to make this inquiry on other banks so you can lower the interest rate. Uh, the other thing that you need to take into account is uh, how long will uh, the, the time that you will be um, paying this uh, debt, right? Uh, so if you get the same amount of time that you will be paying with the previous debt and moreover, you get a lower interest rate, um, well, that would be a good deal. And the other uh, thing that you need to bear in mind when you are trying to adjust your debt installments is obviously that the amount of money that you should be paying every month now that you have made such a deal uh, should be lower. Otherwise, well, we won't be doing anything. Uh, at the end, what we want to do is to free uh, some of the cash flow that we are using just to, to uh, pay debt. On the other hand, as I told you before, you have to adjust your discretionary expenses and moreover, you need to take care of your and expenses. On the other uh, hand, you also have to identify the current savings that you may have. One of them would be, for example, the employee trust funds. Uh, 
this is a benefit that um, some workers have with their company, and it's basically uh, when uh, when you are saving money on the employee trust fund, the company that uh, hired you is also putting some money on your behalf into that fund. So if you have been doing this for a while, probably you will have their uh, savings uh, that you can use in difficult times. There is another type of savings that probably you have in this moment, and they come from these unemployment insurance savings accounts. Uh, here in Colombia, we call it uh, cesantias. So this is the money that you can use when you are not working, uh, when you lost your job, or basically when you are in between jobs. Uh, so you have been making these savings for this moment in special. So uh, in difficult times, as I told you before, if you uh, well face one of these uh, situations, well, you can uh, use uh, these savings that you have done so far um, so you can keep on for a while while the difficult times go by. Okay, so this is about budgeting. Uh, well, uh, uh, some apps that will help you out with uh, budgeting, uh, I have these four icons here. Uh, I will leave the presentation so you can get the name of them. Uh, but I, I will tell you briefly uh, what they do. So the first one, which is like an A, it's called Andro Money. Um, it's good in the sense that you can uh, track down your expenses on a daily basis. So if you are uh, buying a coffee or if you're buying groceries and so on, uh, as long as you are uh, doing this purchase, you can also write down on the app what you have been uh, spending. Uh, therefore, you can track your expenses on a daily basis and you can uh, adjust them. Uh, the second one is called Monify. Um, well, it has a nice feature in the sense that all the information that you have also by tracking your expenses on this app can be synchronized with uh, Google Drive or Dropbox. So uh, let's say if you're thinking about family and, this, uh, and, and all this income is a family income. Uh, well, the, the good thing about these sort of apps is that uh, you can share uh, with the family members uh, the expenses and the income that all of you are perceiving. Uh, therefore, you can have uh, like this uh, control on money, uh, sorry, on familiar income and family expenses. The third one is called Mint. Um, well, one cool feature about that one is that you will be getting reminders uh, about your payments. So you can synchronize or you can just uh, write down uh, uh, the dates of your bills. So you will be, uh, you will have these reminders on your cell phone, on your tablet, or your computer about your payments, right? Uh, even though you can also do that with some banking services that will withdraw your money automatically to pay these services. And the last one is called Settle Up. Uh, this one is to uh, track group expenses. Uh, so this is useful, for example, when uh, you're traveling abroad with a lot of friends or with your family and you have this common budget and you need to uh, track uh, common expenses and uh, check your balance. So this is, these are just some ideas how to, uh, of how to uh, make these budgets uh, related to personal finance uh, for your own based on some uh, apps or things. Now let's talk about savings. So I have this first slide here and I'm going to read the, the, the phrase here. It says, your savings is not the money left out after covering all expenses. And I want I wanted to bring uh, this 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 first phrase here because uh, it is a common mistake to think that the balance between income and expenses 
is savings. Uh, what I'm trying to say here is that uh, savings is not the result of uh, subtracting to your income all the money that you're spending. That's not savings. If you want to have savings habits, uh, the first thing that you need to do is to determine how much money of your income uh, will be destined to savings. Uh, so you need to establish a proportion. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the idea is completely different uh, in the sense that once you get your money, I mean your, your wage or your income, uh -huh, you will be taking out of that money a portion to savings. So you don't, uh, you, you haven't spent even a penny of that money uh, because the first thing that you will be doing is saving it. So this would be one useful thing for creating saving habits. Remember, the first one would be uh, determine the proportion of the income to be saved. And the second one, which is, I believe, very useful, is uh, to try using a lot of financial mechanism, mechanisms uh, in such a way that once your monetary income uh, is in your uh, savings account or your banking account, right? Uh, the bank withdraws part of that income and put it into a uh, savings financial instrument. Uh, so uh, you won't have the, tempta the temptation of withdrawing more money uh, than you're allowed to based on the savings that you're doing, right? Uh, let's continue. So this would be uh, the main uh, structure of your savings. Firstly, uh, we need an emergency fund, okay? Uh, it is recommended that this one should be like 10% of your monthly income. Uh, this, is, uh, this is not binding this percentage. Uh, you can change it. Uh, but the idea here is that we have a lot of um, unforeseen uh, situations every month, every day inclusive, uh, and probably they will require money that we were not uh, considering for such uh, unknown situations. So if we have this emergency fund, well, at least we, we will have discussion so when something unexpected happens, well, uh, we can be calm about that we have at least part of this monetary income saved and, and well, we can use it for these unexpected situations. So once you have constructed your emergency fund, the idea is that uh, if you want to save, uh, you need uh, to establish this uh, Savings objective, uh, you need uh, the, the purpose for saving, you need to be motivated, right? And um, once you, you, you have on your mind what would be your saving goals, uh, you will have to, to uh, have, uh, sorry, you will have to put them a deadline for their fulfillment, fulfillment right? So uh, the idea here is that, uh, as an example, if you want to travel, and if you want to travel at the end of the year, uh, well, your, your objective will be to save money uh, so you can travel, right, at the end of, uh, uh, of the year. So you have uh, a clear goal, you have this motivation because you would like to travel, and moreover, you have now the deadline. Once you have established these elements for your savings goal, well, this is when you need to think about how much money you need to save from today till the deadline of your saving goal uh, in order to accomplish, right? So at the end, you will need, as I told you before, uh, just to construct savings, um, you have to establish clearly your goals, uh, to be motivated about your goals, and moreover, you need 
the deadline. And the deadline is really important because as long as you know your deadline, you will be able to solve this part of the equation, which is how much money of my monthly income should I save in order to accomplish these goals. If your goals are like more for the long term, uh, where you will be needing a lot of monetary resources to accomplish them, such as uh, paying the education of your children, that, that would be a good example. Or if you want to uh, get, uh, uh, if you would like to have more um, income after uh, your jubilation, for example, uh, Besides savings, you need to think about investing, and this is when you go to your bank or uh, when you you search for a, um, a financial planner in order to search for the good alternative. Uh, in, in in that period of time, that will help you out to accomplish those goals. Well. These were the things that I want to share with you today. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I know sometimes it's difficult to be uh, like a lot of time in front of the screen, but uh, for now, this is the way that we can meet. I hope uh, this, is, uh, this will be over sooner than we expected. Uh, that we can be together without being like compromised with our health. Okay, thank you very much once again. Um, I believe you're going to follow with the question, right? Yes, Daniela? yes. So thank you very much for your presentation to identify really important key uh, factors. So we have some questions from the participants. The first question is from Juan Pablo Delgado, and he's asking, the current crisis is creating deep cracks in the economy of Colombian households. How can we innovate in sources of income with an unemployment rate of 20%? Okay, perfect. Juan Pablo, thank you very much for your question. Uh, well, in this moment, I believe it's, uh, it's, it's very difficult to uh, be innovative uh, regarding uh, the income of the households. Uh, the main reason is that we cannot go out, right? And, um, and most of uh, people in Colombia, well, sorry, not most of them, but a lot of people in Colombia, they depend on a daily basis to get their income. Uh, one way to diversify the source of income uh, is through technology, right? So what we have learned from this crisis is that a lot of uh, businesses have become di digital. Uh, so they have been offering their products and services through different platforms. Uh, you can see social media, for example, Instagram, Facebook, uh, a lot of people, they're uh, offering their services and their products through these platforms. And one important key, I believe, uh, for the success of such digital businesses uh, is, the, um, is that uh, as a country, we can uh, use more fintech that we have been using uh, till now. Uh, why fintech? Because uh, well, uh, on the one hand, we can make uh, payments uh, using these digital channels um, in a safer way. Let's say if there is blockchain technology behind that, for example. Um, fintechs because uh, sometimes uh, um, you just don't want to use, uh, let's say, credit cards or you just don't want to use your savings account, so you will have some other options that are also uh, offered in some uh, fintech platforms like digital cashback and things like that, depending on how you use these uh, technologies. 
so definitely because we are like locked down in our houses, one way to, to generate uh, or diversify our monetary income would be through, uh, through digital businesses, right? Uh, I believe that would be the question. Uh, the thing is that we need, uh, sorry, the answer. Uh, the, the, the question is that, well, as a country, we need to improve uh, our access to uh, information technologies, internet, and so on. So a lot of people may see these like another opportunity to generate monetary income. Thank you. Uh, so Maria Castro is asking, what kind of interest rate can we expect post pandemia and how will this affect Colombian household cash flow? Okay, perfect. So for Maria, I believe interest rate interest rates will be uh, um, low for a while. Uh, the thing is that uh, uh, besides the, the, the cuts that our central bank have performed in the intervention rate, we need that these cuts uh, should be implemented also by commercial banks. Uh, and this is really important because uh, in, in this way, um, the monetary policy may influence on uh, consumer spending and also in investing. Uh, after the pandemic, uh, basically, let's say that we are in this situation where we have these um, vaccine and we ha gain access and we all gain access to it. Uh, I believe uh, the economic slowdown will not be over. So as long as the economy is not recovered, uh, interest rates should be uh, low for a while. And, and this would be good for the households in the sense that uh, well, as I told you before, if you still pay your debt, uh, you will gain access to some uh, financial benefits, uh, such as lowering the interest rate that you actually have for your loans. And the result of it would be uh, to lower the monthly standards on, on, on your debt. Uh, therefore, you will have uh, lower pressure on your cost uh, on the cash flow perfect so claudio versategui is asking will the amount of interest to be paid in loans acquired before the pandemic change after the pandemic okay when uh, uh this is a very good question uh, i believe uh if uh, if you um, if you still if you are still paying your debts as before, uh, probably the amount of money that you are uh, expected to pay uh, because of interest uh, will even be lower if you uh, if you um, if you are able to get a lower rate for your current debt, but. Uh, if for any reason you go to your bank and you refinance your debt and one of the package that you get out from refinancing besides the lower rate is that uh, you're entitled to have a lower maturity for your rate uh, that you will, sorry, for your loan. It means that you will be paying your loan uh, for a longer term than expected. Probably the amount of money that you will be spending in interest uh, will be the same or higher. So you need to be very careful when you go to your bank and get these uh, refinancing packages uh, because, uh, well, you can lower the pressure on your cash flow. That would be good. But uh, if the result of refinancing besides the lower rate is a longer period for your debt, probably you will be paying more in interest in interest than before. Okay, so last question, just to wrap it up. Um, it comes from Regina Solano, and she's asking, in terms of economic sectors, 
which will have the highest impact and which will show the fastest recovery? Well, okay, that's a, a, a very interesting question. Um, this is just my opinion, right? Um, well, um, for example, one sector that's been doing great, uh, I know it sounds uh, strange, uh, but um, all, all the sector that has to do with IT, uh, it's been growing as a matter of fact because we are we are all now communicating through these uh, uh, communication platforms. So there has been a huge demand of this um, uh, of this type of technology, and technology will be also gaining even more importance than before uh, because uh, well we are afraid of getting close to each other. Uh, therefore, uh, this type of technology, even though uh, it uh, maintains us close, we're not physically closer. Yeah. So I believe this is one of the reasons why technology would be uh, continue like um, uh, guiding the way of economic sectors. Um, probably one sector that will be recovering fast would be uh, uh, related to uh, uh, food, for example, uh, based on IT, uh, we can see now that uh, a lot of people can just buy groceries online. Well, it is not the same as going to the supermarket and having the opportunity to uh, really choose, uh, I don't know, the fruits or vegetables, uh, but it offers a solution to this uh, problem that we have. Um, so. Uh, uh, food uh, and all related products, I believe um, they will have uh, uh, a, a fast uh, recovery. Uh, probably uh, those that will be most affected would be, uh, let's say, tourism, right? I believe tourism, well, if you were thinking about traveling abroad, this year, probably now you're not thinking about doing it because the likelihood of being sick is really high. So probably uh, tourism will change and uh, in the sense that uh, it will be more local, firstly, and secondly, uh, you will try to go not to such crowded places. Uh, and moreover, you need to gain confidence of the things that uh, at least the government and you are doing to uh, um, to take care of yourself, right? Uh, so probably tourism and all the things uh, linked to that sector, uh, it will take longer to reactivate. Uh, one which will be very damaged, let's say, would be the 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 uh, airline industry. Well, for obvious reasons. Uh, well, I think that that may cover that, that answer. Okay, so thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Freddy, and thank you all for joining us.